so good to worship, come in his presence. He's so good to us. Such an awesome God. And I hope you just never lose like this desire, the heart, the enjoyment of coming in the presence of God. Whether it's two or three people in your living room coming to his presence or getting together as a congregation and worshiping together. Like, it's him. He's just so good. Like, it's not the environment. It's not the sound. It's, I mean, you guys sounded great, but it, it's, uh, it's just the object of our worship. Like, don't lose the wonder of how great he is. Um, that's, that's kind of why we're, we're doing this series on the love of God is the elders got together and they were praying and they just felt like we needed some time to come together as a church and just have the word of God declare to us of how good God is, that we all just sit under the authority of God's word together for a season because we want this to be the foundation of our lives. Um, and we can get distracted by other things. And we're also concerned that maybe for some of you, you don't have this at the foundation, at the core of who you are, is understanding that you're loved by this holy God. And so we said, before we talk about anything else, we got to make sure our people really understand who he is and how much he desires and loves us, because we all have baggage and we all have different teachings or thoughts or things that people have said to us that stick, and they shouldn't. And so understand, this is not just teaching about the love of God, but during these next few weeks, we want us all to be in prayer that some of these strongholds that are in our minds and even in our hearts at the core of who we are, some of those things would be broken, okay? So teaching, biblical teaching is important, but it's not sufficient. Okay, so the truth needs to be declared, but we also have to be deep in prayer because there's a mystery that happens where in that demonic realm, things are literally broken through our united prayers. Okay, that's why Paul didn't just lecture the Ephesians and just send a letter off to them. He says, I'm on my knees praying for you because I need this mystery to happen. I need the eyes of your hearts enlightened. I need a strength to come from heaven to enter into the core of your being so that Christ can dwell in there. That doesn't just happen from, to sing off, I think this thing died. All right, I'll grab the other one. Oh, here it is. All right. Um, what did I say? Oh, yeah, it doesn't just happen. He goes, it, it has, it's, there's a mystery. See, sometimes, okay, and I know some of you guys are studying, you're in college, and, and so everything's about, okay, let me gather this information so that I can pass this test. Okay, that's what I did. That's, I, I was good at it. I just, I could ace tests. But I didn't know what I was really saying. I just knew the right answer. And I didn't really know. I didn't really understand it. And sometimes that can happen in the church, is we get this information, but it doesn't go in and stick and become a part of us. We don't really know it. And that's what Paul's prayer is. I want you to know the love of Christ, which surpasses comprehension. I was also reading, um, last week, I was in Brazil, and uh, I'm jet lagged, I'm tired, I'm like, man, why do I fly for 20 hours and then share a little bit? They could have just listened to me online. They could have just read one of my books. And I'm in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, um, and this, this really impacted me, where Paul says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And it hit me because this first time I recognized, wait, this is in the book of Romans. 
He said in the book of Romans, the book of Romans is incredible. Some say that's the most important book of the Bible if there is such a thing. Um, the book of Romans is the most extensive you know, book helping us understand the beauty of the gospel. And so in the midst of Paul writing a letter to this church that lays out a lot of information and theology, he goes, but I can't wait till I come to you because I want to impart something spiritual. See, a lot of times we think, okay, let me go to church, and when the guy preaches, he'll teach me something I don't know, you know, which I probably will, because I'm pretty intelligent. And, and so the whole idea of tell me something I don't know, but Paul's point is, I'm going to write this whole letter to you, give you all this information, but I can't wait to come to you, that I might impart something spiritual to you. Something, see, we don't think about this. But the Bible talks about there's something about when the saints come together. There's a power. And when we love each other, okay? We don't just critique each other. We're not judging each other. We come together to love each other. There's something mysterious that happens in this room when we abide in love where God changes us and does things in our inner being that we may not see immediately, but by faith. I think there's something when we take communion together that we don't see immediately. There's these mysteries, and that's why Paul can write a letter with so much information, but then he gets on his knees and he says, I'm praying for you, and I can't wait to see you. I want something spiritual imparted there. And then we are mutually edified by each other spiritually in some supernatural way. Because I believe the Holy Spirit is in this room with us right now. in the church we can't just say things like that without recognizing what we're saying we're saying the third person of the trinity in the room with us that's heavy that's not just something to throw out there just shrimping it oh the spirit of the lord is with us it's like the spirit of the holy god is here the presence of the resurrected christ in the room with us God the Father and the Son coming and dwelling in us. These are heavy truths. And somehow if we love one another, God, his love is manifest. Or it, 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 Even though we don't see him, somehow he's present in a real way. We can't just shrug our shoulders at these things. That when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we're fellowshipping with the body and blood of Christ. Like this, this can't get old to us. You know, we see everything that's going on in the world and, uh, and, and, and a lot of us are going, gosh, it seems like everything's coming together here at the end. Well, all those parables are about, so you better stay alert. I was in San Francisco this morning with our pastors out in San Francisco, and I was going, man, we got to stay alert right now, okay? And for some of us who grew up in the church, I remember being 15, 16 years old when they told us about the return of Christ, and, and so I would be like, oh man, he might return tonight. And I'd be up late at night going, God, I'll be the one that's ready. If you come tonight, I'm ready. I remember just thinking that way as a 16 year old. Like this might be it. I'm gonna walk this week differently because Jesus might return. Well, he didn't. And then a few years later, another talk gets me stirred up. 
and another talk and another talk. And then I remember during uh, Y2K, for those who are alive, year 2000, this is it, you know, this is gonna happen. I remember Desert Storm, no, this is when it's gonna happen. I remember you know, the whole oil embargo, it's just like all these things. And you think this might be the time when Christ comes. And then when it doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen, it can cause you to kind of lose that anticipation. And so now when everything's going on around the world and we may be starting World War III, it's very easy to kind of go, I'm not going to get too excited about it because I was excited about Y2K and I was excited about this and this and this. And I thought at 9-11, that was going to be the start of everything. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. But remember what God says in 2 Peter. He goes, Look, everything I say is going to happen is going to happen. And I'm not slow. When I say something, it's going to happen. And just don't lose the fact that with me, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. And he expects us to stay alert. And so I don't regret as a 16-year-old staying up late at night praying to God and going, if tonight's the night, I'm waiting for you. I'm ready for you. I don't regret in college doing the same thing. I don't regret, you know, in my, my late 20s doing the same thing or in my 30s or in my 40s and now in my 50s. I'm going to do it again and go, God, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. And, and part of me is like, ah, it's just so not fair. You know, like I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, but it's kind of like those, uh, that parable about the workers that have been working for 11 hours. And then some of you kids, this is the first time you've really thought about the return of Christ. And if he really comes, it's like, oh, that's so not fair. You got it on your first try. I've been waiting for him for 40 years, you know? And people have been waiting for him for 2,000 years. And it's just this idea, we gotta keep the, the lambs burning, make sure the oil is still there and don't let all those other times, you know, when you thought he was coming, because God made a promise to Adam. He told Adam a deliverer is going to come. So Adam's probably thinking, ooh, is it my son Seth? Is he the one? You know, is it this? Is it? He didn't come for 4,000 years. Okay, 4,000 years before the coming of Christ. And so now Christ, and yet God wanted all of those people for all those 4,000 years to be trusting in his word, waiting for him. And so when Christ says, I'm coming back, it's very easy for us to go, man, it's been almost 2,000 years. And I'm going, I'm going to stay alert. I'm going to stay alert. I'm going to be focused. Come, Lord Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want you to come, Jesus, and reign on this earth. And I want to be alert. I want to be waiting. I don't want to be in a fog. In 1 Peter 4, verse 7, it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Okay? He says, the end of all things is at hand, so you better have your mind clear, okay? You better just get rid of all of the junk that's cluttering your mind so that you can pray. He goes, exercise self-control. You need self-control in order to be sober-minded. You, you gotta not, where's my phone? Toss me my phone, please. Sweetheart, beautiful, okay. Um, so, I, we got to have self-control to be able to just put this thing down, walk away from it so that my mind is clear. My concern, I don't think it's coincidence that God says the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. I don't think it's coincidence that Christ would be coming at a time when everyone's like the opposite of sober-minded, self-controlled, and you try to pray. You gotta understand, 
Christianity from the start was this monastic, had this monastic side of it, like a monasterial where I get alone, I get in silence, I come into the presence of God, and I just experience him, and I am focused on him, and I'm meditating on his truths. I can take one deep truth and meditate on it all day. I'm going to go in a cave and just dwell on this and, and have this intimate time with the Lord. It's always been that. There's always been a part of our faith until now. Because we have a generation that says, pray for an hour straight? I can't pray for two minutes straight without my mind wandering. And yet, we don't have the self-control to put that aside so that we can be sober-minded and we really can pray. And why is that so important? Because the Bible is so clear that our battle is not flesh and blood. See, we have, we have, I, have, I go to these church uh, growth things where they're like, oh, you got to dress better. You got to, you know, sing better. You know, a little fog in the room it makes you feel good. Ha! You know, it's like all this stuff. Let's do all of these things in the flesh. And that's what's going to grow your church. And that's how this is going to change. And this, and, and it's like, no, this is a spiritual battle. We're wrestling against not flesh and blood, not, okay, let's do some things in the flesh and that'll change your heart. No, just like the Holy Spirit is in this room. They're demonic forces. We know the verses, we memorize them. They just don't change us. Ephesians says your wrestle is not flesh and blood. You can sit and argue with someone all day long. And again, that's necessary at times, but it's not sufficient because it's not about this flesh and blood. Let me talk you into something. There's something spiritual going on. And that's why Paul's on his knees. That's why I pray that something spiritual is imparted during this series on the love of God where it's not just me saying stuff about him. But in the spiritual world, things are unlocked. And I don't know how that works. But the Bible says that there's these this cosmic powers over this present darkness. So the present darkness that you see in the world, all these ideas about sexuality and marriage and whatever else, this lawlessness, it's not just human beings coming up with a new idea. He says there are cosmic powers over this present darkness. That's why in the end times when there's an increase in lawlessness, he goes, you better be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Because you're going to try to gut this out in the flesh, you're not going to pull it off and you're not going to impact anyone. But if you're abiding in Christ deeply in prayer because you can pray, that's what's going to impact people. That's what's going to impact this community. And so, man, I just encourage you guys to live differently than the rest of the world during this time. That's always been God's command to us. Be holy as I am holy. Don't be like, God isn't like everyone else. And that's why he says there's a narrow road that leads to life and few will find it. And there's a wide road that leads to destruction. So if you're going to be popular, you're going to be wrong. Okay? It's a wide, easy road. It's easy to go down this road because everyone's doing it. But he's telling us, you guys live differently because you believe something different. Be holy as I am holy. And so you guys got to be careful when everybody is doing it. It's probably wrong. When has the majority ever been right in the scriptures? When do you ever see that? It's Jesus and his little band of disciples.
I've been getting some texts from people in Israel, and uh, it's amazing. Um, the faith of some of these people, Palestinian or Jewish, believers in Messiah. I, let me explain what living differently looks like. Some of you were there in Israel with me when we were worshiping with Jews who believe in Yeshua. And they were alongside Palestinians who believe in Yeshua. And you got to understand that unity that those Jews and Arabs had and the cost of it. Okay, so to be a Palestinian and to go talk to Jews and embrace them and love them, guess what? Every Palestinian hates you now because you're embracing the enemy. And not only that, all the Jews already hate you because you're Palestinian. So then why would you embrace this Jew? Well, because Ephesians 2 says that what Christ did was he destroyed the hostility on the cross. He broke it down in his own body. And they believe that. And so they're going, okay, I know you're Jewish and you have, you know, this, the, all my people want to destroy you, extinguish you, but you love Jesus and we're a part of the same body. And so in the same way, you've got these Messianic believers who are looking at these Palestinians that so many see as the enemy, and they're going, I love you. Man, I, I was sitting at a dinner table with this old uh, Jewish woman and this, this old Palestinian woman and just listening to them exchange compliments to one another and tell each other why they love each other so much. And I'm going, that is crazy. I felt like I was in the sacred moment as they're just telling each other, no, no, you're great because of this. No, you are amazing because of this. And I'm like, meanwhile, there's a war going on, but not in the body of Christ. And they have forsaken so much. They're rejected by both sides because they refuse to divide from the body of Christ. Man, that should be an example to us. When we're ready to fight over anything and leave over anything, some of you, this might be your last Sunday because I'll say something and you're like, I'm done. And yet we see this example of oneness, of unity that's in the body of Christ. And you know what they're texting me right now? These are people whose kids are at war in Gaza right now and they're saying, pray for the unity of the church. Pray that this war doesn't destroy our unity. We love our Iranian brothers that are passionately worshiping Jesus. That somehow in this time we unite as the body of Christ. Like we've got to be different. Because you read the news and you have these people in these protests saying, yes, gas the Jews, kill anyone with Jewish blood. Then you have another group that go, yeah, kill anyone with, with Arab blood. You know, kill the Jews, kill the Arabs, kill them all. And then at that time, we as believers go, wait, I can't say that because I have brothers and sisters that are Jews and Arabs. And in Christ, there's a new body forming. There's a new army that's unified. This says, no, we're going to die together. We're going to live together. We're going to die together. We are one because of what Christ did. And so understand, we have to be people that go, it's not about Jewish blood. It's not about Arabic blood. It's about the blood of Christ is in me. I fellowship with the body and blood of Jesus. And that's bigger. That is way bigger to me than anything. That when I take of the bread and I take of the cup, I am saying I am fellowshipping with the body and blood of Jesus. And that's eternal. See, when, I, when I'm in that eternal state, 
forever. I don't think I'm going to be Chinese anymore. Okay? I might be. We might all be. Um, but I, I don't think so. It, the idea is this blood is temporary. His blood is forever. And that's the bloodline we associate with here. And so we pray for the unity. And we pray for what's going on over there. Because here's the thing. Like, well, you know, we just got done reading Jeremiah. And God would just say, I'm going to destroy the city. Or I'm going to let the city thrive for a little bit. But I'm going to destroy you later. It's, it's weird, right? It's like, well, I'm going to let you overtake Jerusalem. And, but then later on, I'm going to punish you for taking over Jerusalem. And, it, you know, he just ordains these things. And, and for us, we never would have come up with this plan. And that's where we just have to humbly go, wow, God, your ways. You've had plans from 6,000 years ago at least. And who am I to really know what's going on? But here's what I know to pray for, for your church to stay united that our church would stay awake and alert at this time. And then we pray for the salvation of everyone there. We pray for peace because God loves the world. He loves humans. He loves people. And here are people that are killing each other. And in, unless you think what one side is for God and one side is not, understand these people that are fighting in the war are not followers of Jesus like 90-something percent of them, okay? And some of them actually believe that by dying in this war, that guarantees them entrance into paradise. To me, that's the worst victim. Imagine you grew up being told, if you die killing a Jew or in some sort of jihad, then right when you die, you enter into paradise. Instead, biblically, they stand before a holy God without forgiveness. That should break our hearts. And then understand on the Jewish side, I mean, Romans 11 explains like they're resistant to the gospel. They're enemies to the gospel at this point. You think those are followers of Jesus forgiven by the blood of Christ that are entering the battle? It's a terrifying thought. No one wins. And this is why we pray for peace. And last week when I was in Brazil, it was Thursday night in Brazil and I knew that Friday the 13th was the next day. That was the day that the Hamas had declared it's going to be a global jihad. They were calling for it, calling everyone from all places to act against, you know, to protest and do more than protest. And so you're thinking, oh, my gosh, we could wake up to a different world tomorrow. I was talking to hundreds of pastors. and I go, do you understand? We could wake up to an entirely different world tomorrow. And I said, why did God have me come out and meet with this hundreds of leaders in the church on the night before this is all supposed to go down? Do we believe that we could come together in this room and actually change what happens tomorrow? Do we believe that our prayers, if we can get them focused on him, God can sit on his throne and make a decision and show mercy and grace and maybe calm things down somehow. And we had a room full of people, leaders, worshiping that night, praying, God, please have mercy. And when you, you know, you wake up the next morning, you read the news and it's like, huh. Not a lot happened. Now you go, well, that was probably coincidence, da 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 I believe our prayers did something. And I believe we have that type of power that God's given us, that type of authority through prayer 
And I would just encourage you guys to stay awake during this time and stay alert. And I get it, this thing could calm down. It might not be World War III. It might not be all these casualties, I think. And it might, I, we don't know. And yes, there's other times I've gotten excited in my life, not excited, but like burdened, like, wow, this could be it, this could be it, and it wasn't it. But you gotta understand, God says, I want you eagerly awaiting my return. And that doesn't mean, you know, be eager for a week. It means 40 years. It means the rest of your life. He wanted that Old Testament, all those believers to expect the Messiah and they had to expect for 4,000 years, okay? So don't let this immediacy of, oh, you know, hey, this guy didn't text me back. It's been, you know, 40 seconds. That world that we live in that causes us to be impatient and just lose it. You hey, guys, let's not do that. Let's stay focused. Um, wow, I spent a lot of time on that. But I, I feel like it's important because Remember the last time when we gathered in here, we talked about how we're a body and you mourn with those who mourn. You rejoice with those who rejoice. So it's kind of weird to just have a gathering. I mean, don't you feel a little weird sometimes like going through life and knowing what's going on over there, knowing that people are terrified terrified millions of people are terrified as they're hearing bombs go on everywhere and so we have to mourn with them we have to mourn with those who have lost parents and children in this war thousands of people and we need to repent of it We want to feel what God feels. Yesterday I was in Minnesota and uh, actually the day before I was doing this event for orphans in, uh, in Africa. And, and a guy got up and spoke, a young guy who just got back from Africa. And he was talking about what he saw, what he experienced and how broken he was over these kids. And very sincere, not like cheesy Christian thing. He was sincere, like he just like, whoa, this guy was impacted, he can hardly talk. And I was super convicted by him because I thought I used to be like him. I remember the first time I came back from Africa, you know, Lisa remembers it well, like I, I'm like, honey, I saw these kids eating out of the trash. I saw two little girls about Mercy and Rachel's age, you know, they're eating out of the trash. They're just digging through the trash heap and I'm supposed to love them as I love myself. What would it look like if I loved them as much as I loved my own two little girls? I only had two at that time. Life was easy. And uh, the whole idea was like, man, honey, we got to sell whatever we can. We got to get out of this house. We got to get out of this, this, this. Man, I'm supposed to love them like I love myself. And, uh, and so we move, we downsize. Man, I remember when I heard about human trafficking for the first time. I didn't know what, I, I didn't, I, I don't care. What do you mean human trafficking? What does that even mean? This is like 20 years ago. And when I heard about little girls being trafficked sexually and this and that, I'm like, what, what? I, and, you know, and again, I, I started imagining what if, what if it was one of my girls, you know? Like, what would I do? Would I just get up and preach a nice little sermon? No, 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 I would do something. And I remember going to the church. I remember staying up, crying myself to sleep, just 
trying to not even think about my kids being trafficked, but I, you know, when God's saying, care for them like you care for your own children, man, just crying. That's what I felt. And so that's why it was so convicting when I saw this young man up there weeping over these orphans. And, and I'm going, I used to feel like that. What, what happened to me? Did I, did I lose some of this? Man, I used to wait tables, and I remember coming home one night and just, you know, after going to a party with a bunch of my waiters and waitress friends and coming home having such a good time, and then it hit me, they don't know you, Jesus. And I'm trying to share with them, but I'm, I'm so concerned. They don't know you. I don't want them to die. Keep them alive. Change them. I just began crying, crying, crying because they weren't saved. See, I, I felt these things. And as I was listening to these guys talk and the sacrifice they were making for these orphans, I just said, God, would you pour your grace on me so that I feel that again? Because that's God's grace. It sucks being self-centered, selfish, thinking about yourself, feeling nothing for them. I don't want to be that. I'm approaching the end, whether this is the end of the earth or not. It's the end of me soon. You know, how much longer can we live? And it's just the whole idea that, God, I want all of that, that heart of yours. Break my heart for what breaks yours. I want Christ, the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. I want all of it. Whatever drove him to the earth to be crucified on a cross because of his love for us, I need that in my heart. I don't want to lose that. I want oil in my lamp. I want to be burning, pining away for the day you return and come establish your throne here on earth because you so loved us. You wanted us. You desire us. I'm just going to share one more thought. Uh, I'm not going to get to my notes today. I'll do that next week. Um, one other thought in regards to uh, everything that's going on over there. Um, hopefully this ties it together. Lord, help me. There's this passage in um, Luke chapter 13, and in Luke 13, there was this, there's a couple things that happened there. In Luke 13, it says, there was some present at that very time who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do not think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Or do you think? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Okay, what was going on at that time, there were some people that, uh, that Pilate kind of killed. Well, he didn't kind of kill. He really killed them. He killed them, and the blood was mingled with the sacrifice. And, and so we were having discussion like, okay, why would those people die? Okay, let's think through the sacrifice. Like maybe they were worse sinners than everyone else. And so God in his sovereignty chose those people. And then there's, then they were also telling Jesus, okay, you know, what about that, that tower that fell in Siloam? And 18 people died. 
Like, did God in his sovereignty pick those 18 and go, who are the most evil? I'll just have them walking by the tower at that moment, and then the tower will fall. Woo, we'll rid the earth of those 18. And they're having these discussions about things they really don't know. And Jesus' comment to them is, hey, don't think that way. He goes, but unless you repent, you too will perish. He basically says, hey, you're trying to figure out all this other stuff. Worry about yourself. I remember Ellie when she was a little kid. She was in fourth grade. <laughs> she came home all distraught. My teacher said, worry about myself. I'm like, well, what happened? Well, I was telling her what, you know, Grant H. did and what, you know, Susie did. And, and she just looked at me and says, worry about yourself. I'm like, she's right. Quit tattling on everyone else. Worry about yourself. All right? Okay. And uh, it, it's just that, the, you know, I don't know. For some reason, our kids tend to want to see what tell on other kids. So they tell us all about your kids. And it's just that that's the thing. We're like, hey, just worry about yourself. And that's really what Jesus is telling the people right there. You know, they're going, hey, was this guy more evil? Was this guy more evil? And Jesus says, hey, just worry about yourself. Unless you repent, you too will perish. And look, I know we're around people that ask you questions. Well, but look at what the Jews did. Wait, but look at what the Palestinians did. And I'm saying, look at what we as Americans are doing. You know, when I go to the Middle East, I begin to understand, because I used to watch the news, and I remember when they started labeling the US as the great Satan, right? You ever seen that? In the Middle East, they just referred to the U.S. They burned U.S. flags. And I think it was back in the Bush days, you know, like the U.S. is the great Satan. I'm like, what? what are you guys talking about? What are you talking about? Then I start spending time over there, and they start describing what's happened amongst their people because of the influence in the U.S. They say, you know what? Our women used to cover themselves up modestly. And then you import, you export all of this Hollywood, hoochie, you know, like this, this, this. You glamorize it. And then, you know, they even talked about like, uh, you know, marriage. They go, we used to, you know, just, we had arranged marriages. And then you guys export this, no, you got to find the best looking, perfect personality. And then you leave them if they're not right and this and this and this. That's not the way it's been here for thousands of years. But we learn it from you guys, and you export it to us. And so now we're starting to, you know, get in. This is why we look at you as this great evil. It's everything that you're sending out. And I thought, whoa, I didn't think about that. And here's, here's something super crazy. Because we're, we're reading, you know, Revelation. We're reading um, Jeremiah about Babylon the Great. Um, and Babylon, this evil, you know, empire that I believe is, there's this demonic spirit behind it all. I mean, you know that Babel, Babel, Tower of Babel, Babylon, it's this spirit that's continued on. And, and it's interesting, one year I was with Rachel, um, and we were in Hollywood when we went and watched that play. Was that when you were 14 or 16? 14. And I borrowed a friend's Porsche, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to take her out. She's about to start high school, and I just wanted to get her in the right mindset. And I don't know why the Porsche helped, but it was just more like, I just want to have fun. Let's like celebrate, but let's, let's talk. Let's have this awesome time. And so we go into Hollywood, and... Uh, and we're right there in Hollywood and Highland. There's this big mall, um, I, I forget what it's called. And, uh, 
and, and the, the Oscars are about to take place soon. And so you've got uh, the red carpet, you know, we're looking down and we see the red carpet as we're in this courtyard of this awesome mall in the middle of Hollywood. And, uh, and as we're looking down, I look on the wall and there's a plaque. And the plaque says, Court of Babylon. Like this area that we're in was called the Court of Babylon. I thought, why would you label a court the Court of Babylon? And then I look up and I suddenly realize there are these giant statues of Babylonian gods. Like half man, half creature, like they're bad. And you can read about it right there on the plaque. And it's, this is the whole idea is like, why am I standing in a court in Hollywood in the year whatever, 2000 and something, and, uh, and there's these Babylonian gods when so many say that Hollywood is the great Babylon exporting all of this idolatry and evil around the world. I just go, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't mean to get into all of that. I just, to me, I'm just going, look, like Jesus says in Luke 13, we can judge all day who's right or wrong out there. Instead, we got to start looking at our own lives and going, am I embracing something here that is demonic? Am I loving certain things in the world? And we have to look at ourselves as Americans where for so many years we held the line biblically. Then in the 60s, we start taking prayer out of schools, the commandments out of the schools, everything's gone. And now here we are in the Bay Area and we're in this godless post-Christian time. And the Bible says, because there's an increase in lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. And that's why we in this room just go, you know what? I want to be like my Jewish and Palestinian brothers and sisters who are in Jerusalem right now, worshiping together, living differently. God's calling us to live differently, to be holy because he's holy. And I think the end is near. I could be wrong, but I'm going to live like the end is near and I'm going to stay alert. Even though I've been trying to do this for 40 years, I go, it's going to be right one of these times. There's just too much coming together at once. And so we as a church are getting together for the next few weeks, um, studying the love of God. I really will focus on that next week. I know something crazy happens this week, but um, I pray that something would be imparted this morning. Just like that young man imparted something to me a couple days ago in Minnesota. He wasn't preaching to me, I was the other speaker, but he imparted something to me, an urgency to care again. And I'm praying that somehow that's imparted to you today, imparted to us today. This is the time to wake up, be alert, keep oil in our lamps, be eagerly away in the return of Christ, pray for the peace in Israel, pray for God's grace on these people, pray for this war to end quickly, um, pray for the gospel to be preached and for the salvation of all of these people because God loves them. And let's mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Father, I ask that you would take the word that was spoken today and just embed it in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I ask that you give us the strength to wake up, to strengthen what remains. Give us self-control 
so that we can be sober-minded, ready for your return. Give us self-control to not stare at every video. I feel like we've got to answer every text within seconds and that we can really pray. God, we pray against the darkness here in East Palo Alto. God, we don't just accept it, Lord. We believe that we, united as a body, can actually open the eyes of the blind. Those who are spiritually blind and are just following along these cosmic powers of this present darkness, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come together. We unite as your bride, and we come before your holy throne of grace, and we ask you to pour grace out on this city, we pray that you fill this church and churches around with people who, who fall on their faces and repent, that we don't just sit and judge people on the other side of the world, but that there be repentance here and a new life, a light. May we embrace each other as our body and in, embrace our, our Jewish and Arab brothers and sisters and say, no, Christ died for us and I will not divide from them. Thank you, Lord, that you are building your church at this time. Thank you, God. And may this not be an emotion that goes away when we leave this room, but may this be birthed of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.